Welcome to the closing morning of Colloquium 2012. It's a pleasure to welcome you back this morning. I do have some thank yous I need to give. One of the nicest things Sherman always did <clears throat> whenever you talked to him on the phone was he would end almost every phone call with thank you and then hang up because he always knew that what you were doing was important and worth acknowledging. So there are a number of thank yous I need to offer. There is a list of thank yous in the program book, which I do encourage you to take a look at. And if you do see people with those name tags on <laughs> or doing the jobs, uh, make sure to thank them as well. But I do want to recognize a few uh, organizations and individuals. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Fiedler Hillel at Northwestern University for partnering with us on this program, for making this space available to us. Uh, it really, I think, has been a wonderful meeting space, and the access to the campus has been great. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come to this campus and to do our program here. And in relation to that, I also want to offer a great thank you to the technical staff of the uh, IT department of Northwestern University that has helped to provide all the projection assistance, the webcasting, the recording. <laughs> Mike Curtis has taken the lead on it, but Stephanie Foster has also worked very closely. Uh, Mike, unfortunately, wasn't feeling well this morning, so in absentia, I thank him. I thank him last night also uh, for their hard work in putting this program together so that it went very as smoothly as it did. Um, I also want to make sure to thank our conference planner, Linda Antman, who was a fantastic, fantastic organizer to work with on the hotel and restaurant lists and rentals and room reservations and anything you could ask for. She was on top of it, and she was excellent. Um, and so I very much want to thank her. Obviously, I want to thank all of our volunteers who helped with the book table and help with the registration table and help with picking up the cards for the discussions and with driving people to the airport and from the airport and everything else that was involved in putting this together, from helping to draft the language of the initial program and all the way through the process. Uh, colloquium is always an achievement of a group. It's not any one person's program. And so I very much want to thank all the volunteers and uh, lay people that helped to put this together. <clears throat> I do want to recognize two staff people of the International Institute, uh, Rabbi Miriam Jerris, who is the Associate Professor of Professional Development, and also Jeremy Owens, our Administrative Assistant. <laughs> Tireless work to put this together. And I would be in big, big trouble if I did not recognize, <laughs> if I did not recognize my wife, A.J. Shalom, who has been the chair of the colloquium committee, who has been the organizer extraordinaire to put all of the details together to make this happen, and so she deserves a round of applause, too. <laughs> and last, I have to offer a thank you to our presenters. I haven't heard Sivan yet, but I know she'll be wonderful. And everyone else that has been part of this colloquium and all the discussions that we've had and all the outside conversations that we've had, the presentations, the slides, it has been fascinating, it has been spellbinding, it has been insightful and eye-opening. I think it has been a marvelous colloquium. I'm sure one always used to say this is the best one ever, every time. But this one has been the best one ever. And I want to thank all of these speakers for all their hard work in putting this on. And so now, without any further ado, I would like to turn over the program to Rabbi Jeffrey Falick, who will introduce Rabbi Moss. Well, I think I speak for everybody, Adam, in saying that we want to thank you, too. <laughs> so when I first joined this movement, which was just a few short years ago, one of the things that I was clueless about and very curious to know because of my own background was what the connection was to Israel. Israel, in many ways, Zionism was my, uh, was my religion growing up. And it was very important to me to see when I got to the Birmingham temple that not only were there all the signs that you would normally see in a, in a congregation, the Israeli flag and those kinds of things, but more importantly, there was a person there named Rabbi Sivan Malkin Mas who was making a presentation and presenting the Israeli point of view. And I thought to myself, this is going to be a very good home for me. I think that most of you who have been to Colloquia before, or have been involved in our movement, have had the privilege to hear Rabbi Moss. She is the first Israeli rabbi ordained by the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, or Temurah as it's known in Israel. She is now the dean of the Temurah Israel branch, 
and director of the Secular Library. She publishes work on Judaism as a culture in Israel. She's previously run a kibbutz educational system and served in what I personally know to have been, uh, to, to be a very, very challenging and difficult and, and important job of being a shlicha to one of our major communities here in the United States, an emissary on behalf of the Jewish Agency in Detroit. Uh, without further ado, it's my great privilege, and I really mean that, to introduce Rabbi Sivan Malkin Mas. Um, thank you for the uh, introductions, um, and uh, thank you, Adam, for pulling all this together without your leadership uh, on so many aspects of this uh, institute. We wouldn't be here today. Um, thank you for the board of this institute who's making all this uh, possible, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I am excited. Um, so you'll have to bear with my uh, shivering voice. <laughs> but um, uh, it's always a challenge for me to do this in English. My uh, accent deceives. It sounds like I know English, but I don't really. <laughs> so um, after listening to the wonderful presentations that we've had uh, before, um, I sort of changed my speech. That means I stayed up till about 3 o'clock last night. <laughs> I mean today. And um, trying to figure out uh, what to do. In other words, not what I should be talking about, uh, but we have to go out there and do something. Um, so um, the question is, Whose authority is it anyway? In other words, when we're talking about our uh, Judaism, comprised of whatever it's comprised of, whose authority? What's the legitimization process of this? So I would like to remind you the way that uh, Sherwin will probably have started this talk. And he would say something like this, I think. If we would like to summarize the uh, roots of um, the secular humanistic uh, Judaism, we would say that probably one was the Enlightenment, which transformed the thinking of people in Western Europe spread over the Western world, embracing the Jews. The Jews didn't start it. The second would be what he referred to as Jewish nationalism, which was the Zionist movement. Its aim was to normalize the Jewish people, to give them territory, independence, and dignity. We could say that wishing for Israel to be a normal country is both a blessing and a curse. When you don't have territory, independence and dignity is what you wish for. But needless to say, when you do have territory, it's a problem, it may not be the solution but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> then he would probably talk about dichotomy and would say the secular revolution created overwhelming dichotomies. The dichotomy of knowledge, the world of science altered the way we see the world and what we believe. Think about beliefs that science has brought to us, not only knowledge, and dichotomy of values. He talks about the concept of suffering. He talks about the fact that for thousands of years, or at least hundreds of years that we know of, people lived a very poor life, a life of suffering. They 
attributed to that suffering a redemptive power. Why? Because the focus of life was not this world. But why would it be? If your life is suffering, why would you want it to be the focus of your life? So the focus is the life after this life. So this suffering must be for some reason, therefore it has a redemptive power. Somewhere in the 17th, 18th century, there was this revival of notions that this uh, wonderful philosopher by the name of Epicurus uh, came up with, and that was the idea that we can aspire to happiness. It is legitimate to aspire to happiness now in this world. Just think about the music of Mozart for a minute. What joyfulness, what happiness there is in this wonderful music saying happiness is okay. Think about the Declaration of Independence saying legitimate, aspire, pursue happiness. This is what we should be doing. So the focus shifted. The focus shifted to the now, to this world. Think about, think about sending your kids to, it wasn't called daycare then, but think about it as daycare. And if you lived in a Christian world and you sent your kids to this daycare, who would be your teachers? The nuns. Whose authority is it anyway? And if something happened and you did something wrong, who would judge you? The priest? The bishop? Whose authority? And if something was physically wrong with you, you would go to a doctor. Well, who were the doctors? Church? The authority of knowledge, authority of values, of what right and wrong, was all there. And then a revolution of universities happened. And in that revolution, suddenly, in order to be a supplier of knowledge, somebody that educates you, you had to study how to teach. You had to acquire knowledge. So just, it didn't happen that way, but just imagine the surprise. You know, you take your kid to kindergarten and suddenly there's no nun there. There's somebody there that says, I can teach you. Why? Because I studied. That's a different sense of authority. The focus is on the teacher, the person, the knowledge. The focus is human. And suddenly, when you have to go to trial, you stand in court, and who is sitting there? A judge. Why? Because he studied. So the focus changed to the present, to the human, to the human authority. That's a great big change. That means that each and every one of us here in this room has a great job because we are the authority. The people are the authority, not the dignitaries, not, not anybody that is given power by a higher power, but power that we empower ourselves and who we decide that for a certain time this person should be our leader. But then he may not be our leader for something else. Or maybe not for long. So under whose authority am I Jewish anyway?
And you know, sometimes you, you have these days where, sometimes it's many days, that you don't necessarily feel one way or another. You don't stop to think all the time who you really are. But we do have a sense of identity. And one of the, I believe, most important questions is to figure out what does this term mean? What's identical to what? What's this identity thing? In Israel, we walk around with an identity card, IDs. Some of you may have that too. What's identical to what? One of the most inspiring talks that uh, I heard from Sherwin, and I think that was one of the reasons that I joined the movement, except for the finger. I got the finger too. Remember the finger from last night? It took a decade, but I finally got the message. And he said that you have to say what you believe, remember? And do as you say. Okay, here we have the identity. When Yaakov Malkin, my father, wrote the book, What Do Secular Jews Believe? That's what he tried to do. He tried to expose the beliefs and to say, well, it may not be popular, certainly not in Israel. You should not talk about two things that are completely unimportant. One is beliefs, the other is politics. But how can you not talk about beliefs? Or how can you not talk about politics? But how can you not talk about beliefs? We have to talk about beliefs. It's legitimate to talk about what we believe. We believe in equality, we believe in justice, and we have a very long list of beliefs. This is us empowering ourselves because you become very weak if you meet another person who has this belief in the supernatural. And, and you have to abide by all these rules and regulations that this person has because he has beliefs. And what about me? Yeah, I, okay, I'll accommodate whatever it is. I'll have a mechitza because you have beliefs. No, no, I have beliefs. So a sense of identity is this bridge between my beliefs, which I must articulate for myself, and bridging it to what I do. And there must be, we must aspire to this to be equal to that, maybe even completely identical. I don't know if that's possible, but at least that's what we need to try and do. That, I believe, is the integrity that Rabbi Wine talked about. What's the integrity? This identity between what I believe, what I say, to what I do. That becomes really, really complicated when you become a rabbi. And why? Because you don't just talk about things, you have to do it. It's not only philosophical ideas, but it's the practice. What do we actually do? Can I keep saying, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore pri agafen, even if I don't believe that God actually made the wine? Can I say it? And Sherwin says no. Our movement says no. I want you to keep that question in mind as I describe a little bit about what is going on in Israel. And I think that what is going on in Israel in public space is very similar to what is going on here in public space, in which we want to engage a majority of people in which their distinction and ideology, as we've heard here and before, is not necessarily what drives them to come to, to an uh, event or to be, participate in something that is Jewish. So I want to keep that question in mind as we go along. <clears throat> so...
So, the reality that we uh, live in is a reality in which the authority could be us, that legitimizing our Jewish culture could be completely up to us. I've asked by uh, members here in the audience to explain a little bit about what's going on with the marriage uh, status in Israel. So I will take you through this. There was a mandatory ordinance which, um, which, which says this, that um, matters of personal status, including marriage and divorce, of the courts will be under the authority of religious communities. That's from 1922. And believe it or not, it didn't really change since then. The issue is, Israel didn't just abide by this Ottoman rule and then British rule and then Israeli law, but it's also signed the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which says, men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. Remember what I talked about identity? If these are the values and this is the law, some discrepancy there. So who cannot marry in Israel? Let's see what we're talking about. Persons that are not classified by religion. The Ministry of Interior estimates today that about 30% of the new immigrants that arrived in Israel from the former Soviet Union are not considered Jewish or any other religion. So we have a new status in Israel, which is called religiousless. There is a new status. But they cannot marry. Because if they were Christian, they could be married by a priest. If they were Muslim, they could marry by a Qadi, but they can't marry. So we have hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands, no less, that can't get married. Or people with controversial religious classification. In other words, people who say that they are Jewish but are not recognized so by the ultra-Orthodox, who are the only ones who can actually marry someone legally in Israel. Or couples with different religious affiliation. The people who we want to embrace are certainly part or the reason why we have this colloquium may not be able to get married in Israel, at least some of them. According to the laws of religion, there are those who are forbidden to marry. Another classification. For example, bastards. Who are they? Persons born to a woman who was married to someone else during her pregnancy. That's, by the way, what it is. So if people confuse you and tell you it's out of wedlock or all kinds of things, like it's just not true. There are, all, there are other little halachic things that I won't talk about uh, right now, but that's basically it. So don't get confused. Certainly, same-sex couples cannot get married in Israel. This is a different issue than being um, registered as married in Israel. What does that mean? That means that if you want to have a civil marriage or any other kind of marriage outside of Israel, you can be registered as married when you come back to Israel by the Ministry of Interior. So you can either 
to sum it up, in order to be listed in Israel as married by the Minister of Interior, you can either have a religious marriage or have a civil marriage outside the State of Israel. The State of Israel is obligated to recognize marriages conducted in other countries. But there are other statuses in Israel which are not unique, that is similar in other countries in the world, and that is what we call cohabitation or common law. And that what, it, what um, it means in Israel in practical terms, because we want to talk about practical terms, it basically means they have the same rights as people that are married. There's no real distinction. That's also important to understand. And this was basically achieved by uh, uh, people who fought for rights for same-sex couples and were, from the early 90s, were able to make a significant change in Israeli law to create this um, almost equality of rights of people who um, live together and um, therefore, there is hardly a difference. There is a great danger in future legislation in Israel, which is on the table. One is the waiver of this, of marriage, of nisuim, of, of this option of saying, let's create something else. Not only on the table, but it's already there. And that is the uh, um, couple covenant, uh, covenant, Brit Zugiut, which is something that was gained, I think it's a loss for us, but it was gained by um, the uh, political parties who wanted those hundreds of thousands of people to be able to get married in Israel. But by doing that, by saying, you can't get married, basically. We will call it something else. We are stripping them from their right to get married. This is a discriminatory legislation. And there are more to come if we don't stop it. And it's a pre precedent in the Jewish world. Things that happen in the Jewish world, it doesn't matter if it happens in Paris or if it happens in America or if it happens in Israel, is, can be dangerous. And it's up to us to keep it from happening. The other danger and that's on the table also, is canceling the status of common law. And there are people who are fighting this. And we must make sure that never changes. Because if we would stop and ask for numbers, I can't tell you how many people today choose to live together under common law marriage cohabitate. Nobody knows. So we don't know how many people opt to live together as couples and have families and there are various estimates. I don't want to even start throwing away numbers here because there are various organi organizations that are throwing up throwing out, sorry, many different numbers, so it would be not okay for me to, to, to give you these descriptions. But we know that there is a growing number every year, quite stable, of more and more people who can get married 
by the Orthodox rabbinate who choose not to. Who, we know these numbers because we, if, if they get married outside of Israel, as I described before, and then sign in at the Ministry of Interior, we can count them. So there's a growing number. It's about a quarter of the marriages that are going on in Israel today, with people that could have gotten married um, otherwise. So where is this question of authority? Whose authority is it to marry? Is it really up to the Orthodox? Is it really up to our Knesset, or to our parliament? Think about it. There's a great change going on, shifting authority. If people say, I don't care, think about the power this has. I don't care. I don't care if the Ministry of Interior writes me up as married. I don't care. You're pulling away the rug under their, their, their feet. They don't have any authority. If nobody's going to go get married with them, they will lose the authority. And the more people that don't, the more effective this becomes. And it's becoming a threat. We'll talk about it in a minute, too. Before I describe the practices that go on in Israel, I want to go back to the concept of dichotomies. Because I think that one of the things we've been discussing here is uh, personalities, people that live with very different backgrounds. And I think that to some extent, each one of us who had two parents, <laughs> there's a combination of two backgrounds. But this, I think it's wrong to describe it as dichotomies. Some of us do that by saying you are this culture and this culture. So it becomes a dichotomy, and there isn't a dichotomy there. Or there's it doesn't have to be. In Israel, the range of religious identities is commonly described by a dichotomy between secular and religious. Chilonim and datim, these are the words that are used. And you can see that in different ways of dressing, educational institutions, daily practices, and so on. A common amendment to this dichotomy, and think about all the time when I'm talking about the religious and secular dichotomy, think about the, the um, cultures, uh, bringing together cultures that, that's part of what I'm trying to describe. So many times when you talk about in Israel, about chilonim and datiim, religious and secular, you would say, OK, you have religious here, and you have secular here. What's the axis here? I don't get it. Are you religious because you believe in God and the less, 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 you become secular? That's not what secularity and humanism is about. It's not, we're not on this axis. So if you put one culture here and one culture there, was my mother half pregnant? <laughs> it doesn't work. It shouldn't be there. There is no access there. <coughs> Bringing this thing together, saying to us, figure out what your identity is. Figure out what you believe in. Figure out the language that you use to describe it. Is, is the language that you use coming from this uh, 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 cultures, these cultures, then that's your language, then that's your identity. It's not a half a half. It's not a third and whatever. It's not. It shouldn't be counted.
Where does this concept of dati come from, religious? We were talking, um, Lynn was describing religious and using uh, terminology that comes from Christianity. Well, dati doesn't come from there. Dati comes from describing people affiliated by the way they behave according to Jewish law. The T comes from a word which we find in the story of Esther in the Bible. It's a Persian word, which is that, which is law, the laws of the kingdom. That's that. That's the T. So law the T is somebody, not the T, is somebody that doesn't abide by certain laws. Make sense? But it doesn't describe what you are in positive terms, which is what we need to do, because we are the authority of our identity. Not just personal, but communal. Not just communal, but public. National, part of our peoplehood. When we describe what is going on in Israel, <laughs> there was a conference now in Haifa which was talking about spiritual Judaism. Describing the phenomena in Israel, which is sort of under the radar that nobody talks about, says that conference. And describing the new age of Judaism in Israel, new age, not only new age, but also New Age. And let me give you just a few descriptions of things that are going on in Israel that will resonate, I am sure, as things that you see around here. Okay? So, psychology, psychotherapy, spiritual counseling, and coaching. Um, Dr. Ruach Midbar is the... Uh, um, is the one that did these classifications. She's, she's a sociologist at, uh, uh, in Israel. Psychologi psychological Jew, Jew age, she calls it, doctrines, present spiritual knowledge of the human spirit mind, sometimes interwind, interwined with cosmology. While some rely on Kabbalistic methods, such as numerology, other Jewish versions of modern Western specify New Age doctrines. For example, conscious thinking teachings. A woman by the name of Yemima Vital, who has uh, passed away in, 19, in 1999, had a great following mostly of celebrities in Israel, which, by the way, is another classification of leadership. <laughs> and as funny as it may sound, in Israel, they are spiritual leaders. I don't think that they're not here, by the way. I, I don't think that they don't make significant changes. I do think. They have great power. So among the people that actually make weddings in Israel are celebrities. Isn't that strange? Not really, because if we have the authority to decide who is my authority, and I think a great writer or somebody else that I appreciate can marry me, why not? It makes sense. It's not that I would choose the same celebrities they chose, not necessarily, but why not? I had a discussion with uh, A.B. Yoshua a few years ago, the writer who said to me, what is this nonsense? What are you doing? I know the authority is in us. I mean, that's like oxygen that I breathe. That I breathe. But weddings? Are you nuts? <laughs> Baby namings? You? And we had this long conversation, and I said to him, I came to him, and I said to him, listen, I want you to write this, and I want you to write this for us. And it's a whole other project we should be talking about some other time. 
And after about an hour and a half that we sat together, he says to me, you know what? My daughter-in-law is going to have a son. They asked me to do the ceremony. <laughs> do you have anything? <laughs> and you think that was the only one? I met with Chaim Be'er, another author in Israel, very famous. I had the same conversation with him. A week later, he was approached by a very good friend of his. He wanted him to wed his daughter. He called me up. So you get to these intersections in life in which you need a solution. You finally have a challenge. You didn't have it before that intersection. Now you do. So not only is the authority in us to be the leaders, the authority in us is to create these intersections, is to create these challenges. Because if the family does not meet on Friday night, or on Saturday, or on Hanukkah, or on Pesach, there is no question. If we meet in Thanksgiving, we have a challenge for Thanksgiving. If we meet for the Seder, we have a challenge for the Seder. If we go to the supermarket a few weeks before Pesach, then we have a challenge. So the, we have the authority to put the question mark, to create the challenge. So, Yamima Avital, New Age in Israel, was born in uh, 29 and died in 99, became the celebrity of, uh, uh, celebrity of celebrities. And <clears throat> she's passed away, and she has some uh, followings, followers, and um, she has made a significant uh, change in people who live a secular way of life and think about it, I'm distinguishing between people that live a secular way of life and secular people who are aware and uh, can articulate what their secularity is. It's a, it's a completely different uh, uh, term and it's a completely different uh, way of life. But people who live a secular way of life uh, also create uh, groups like this, like uh, Yamima or uh, Netanela Magar, um, different people in Israel. And then there are groups that are um, distinguished as body and soul oriented practices. The holistic approach combining body soul practices are, are converted to, Ju to Judaism in an attempt to identify them as being of Jewish origin or to offer a Jewish version of them. Listen to this. Such as Aleph Bet Yoga or Torah Yoga. You have it here too. An ancient Jewish Torah yoga, an ancient, sorry, um, another, another classification, an ancient Jewish martial art called abir. Did you hear about that? Okay. Revealed in 2001 after being concealed for thousands of years, <laughs> warfare tactics and a balance between physical power, inner power, and spiritual strength. So things like that keep coming up, not only in Israel. But that's part of the world we're living in. That's part of the world we're talking about, of all this Jewish um, ability and creativity that is going on there of people that are living a secular way of life. Nature veneration and feminism. This group of Jew age phenomena includes shamanism, magic, feminist spirituality, and more. Two secular new social movements, the green and the feminist one, have a mutual spiritual um, uh, combination. In, a, in a, for example, Hebrew nature, Teva Ivri, and even yielded the unification of two liberal political parties in uh, 2009, which focus on liberal Judaism, but see their practice as a spiritual practice, certainly channeling 
Channeling is the transfer of messages from various supernatural beings, gods, angels, shamanic spirits, things you're aware of here. Certainly, alternative sacred art, also part of the secular way of life, uh, spiritual secular way of life in Israel. So there's something going on. Seeking for spirituality, somebody mentioned it here. Sorry that I don't remember right now who it was that said we need to have people study this, search for spiritual, spirit, spirituality, <laughs> and to see how it connects to this new Jewish world we live in. So we can't describe our Jewish identity in dichotomies as secular and religious. We can't. That's not the reality we live in. We, re we live in this puzzle. Some of it relies on religiosity. Some of it doesn't. Some of it has aspects. Some of it has one day a month of being religious. It's, we have to think about what it means. We, we're talking about the meaning, we're talking about the values in many of, of the present, presenters' speeches here. That's incredibly important in the same list to put our beliefs. Our values, our beliefs, our authority. We have to link it to our authority. <clears throat> okay, these are some statistics. I'm not a statistician, I'm not a mathematician, so if anybody wants to do all kinds of, um, to show that I'm wrong in the math, I could be. But, um, but it does give you a general idea of what the uh, population uh, in Israel is uh, today. Um, so you see that the religious list is a small percentage, but it's a very meaningful one. This is a description of uh, what, uh, what is religious, what is religiousless, and the situation that we found ourselves creating. And why am I saying we and not just Israelis? Because we all fought very hard to get people out of the Soviet Union. And we're all part of this, making, making this new Jewish reality, being the authority. So we cannot let anyone else make that decision. We had a meeting a few months ago with the writer Yoram Kanyuk. And uh, Yoram Kanyuk uh, had um, uh, decided to change his um, title from being Jewish to being, from being religiously Jewish to being religiousless. It's the first one, first person, who has voluntarily took this upon himself. This is very interesting for us. Is this something we should adopt? Think about it. We can still maintain the concept that we're culturally Jewish. We could still maintain the concept that we are part of a peoplehood. Is this a call for action? I would like you to think about this, because I think in the future we have to decide what to do with this issue. It has many ramifications to the Jewish world. Again, if enough numbers make the decision to call themselves religiousless, that can make a great big impact because dati means laws. And if we don't abide by these laws, then we make a new reality. Non-Jewish Jews, 
This is a book by Professor Asher Cohen from uh, Barilan University, who uh, tells the story of how we as a Jewish people brought in people who were considered Jews by one law, the law of return, and not Jews by other laws. It's a very interesting uh, uh, phenomena, but in a country where there's no civil marriage, and we established that fact before, it is an issue. It is an issue for the Jewish world. So there are many organizations around, many, hundreds of organizations around that try to go around that. In other words, to create new laws or new practices or a new reality in Israel, such as this one, which is a big cry for prenup. And I want to tell you that it's a very interesting cry because many religious and some even ultra-Orthodox women wrote in Israeli newspapers saying, Women, make sure you have a prenup. So it's not only a secular issue anymore, but it's going around the orthodox law because that will enable them to settle things in family court, not the ultra-orthodox way. Other uh, or more organizations that have just, this organization has just been able to uh, uh, assist women who were stuck in a situation where they couldn't get a divorce. And they were, um, now there are conditions and uh, different ways in which the uh, men can be forced to be to uh, abide by certain new regulations. This has been a struggle that went on for many years, if I'm not mistaken, at least two decades, that this organization, specifically organ, uh, this organization has been working on. But strides have been made, as you can see. You can say that intermarriage is not accepted by the state. But it is. It's accepted by the mere fact that if people get married outside the state of Israel and it's signed in, then it is. It's like reading the statistics in a different way, as Paul was showing us the other day. So the authority is in us. The legitimization is in us. And how should we do it? One way, which is not listed here, is to make sure that we vote the right people. But that won't happen. Maybe in the future. Not in the close future. The system of government in Israel doesn't work that way. It probably should, but it doesn't. So we have to do. We have to make a difference, we have to change, and we are. One thing we should do is campaign and create a worldwide campaign saying, stop the, the um, unfair situation in which men are deprived of the ability to father Jewishly. That's discrimination, male discrimination, which we must change. And we can, because it depends us, on us in the Jewish world. If they want to, they should be able to. The fact that some institutions and some organizations agree to that, it's not enough. We still have to do the job, all of us. New Family is an organization 
that decided, okay, so common law marriage is not something which is regulated in Israel in the sense that you can go somewhere and show a card that you are identified as cohabit... Okay, you got it. <laughs> so they created a card. And people can sign up because it's our authority. So, you should be able to marry any way you want. You don't have to get married. You can do a bar bat mitzvah any way you want. And what really is fascinating is the Jews, non-Jews approach. What does that mean? If the public that you live with decides, accepts you as Jewish, then you're Jewish for all practical reasons and situations. And that's what happened in Israel. The hundreds of thousands of people that I was talking about that can't get married are accepted by society as Jews. I can tell you that the first time I encountered the issue was when uh, a couple that I was working with towards uh, their marriage, the man said to me, convert me. And I said, what? Now, it sounds so normal to you, but it certainly was not to me. I never, ever in my wildest dreams thought that what I will be doing is converting people or adoption process. I never, ever thought that that would, that would be it. But on the other hand, if we're the authority, why not? And that's what he said. And I said to him, but if we're the authority, you are the authority too. What do you need me for? <laughs> he said, ah, I was brought up in Russia. I need a signed document. We belong to a few coalitions in Israel. We is the International Institute to more. This coalition is called uh, the Forum for Free Choice in Marriage. In other words, however you want to marry, a coalition of about 30 different uh, organizations. And this is a campaign that we uh, came out with um, which uh, talked about the fact that we're, everybody's trying to confine us to one frame. And we can't be confined into one frame. Not of who's a Jew and not of how to get married. These are our rabbis in Israel, 24 of them. 25, I'm there too. And uh, soon we will be ordaining, if they'll hand in their paperwork, um, <laughs> four more, 15 more are studying with us. So we are doing weddings, just like the reform movement is, and the reconstructionist movement is, and the conservative movement is, and none of our weddings count, especially if you're a woman, nobody cares. What are our spiritual centers? The symphony, the Holocaust, almost every major city in the world has a Holocaust memorial. Is that our spiritual center? Should it be? Can we do something there that is very, very meaningful for everybody? Should we leave them as memorials that we come to look at? Should we revitalize them in some way? Is that one of our public spaces? 
Is that our public space? Is that our spiritual center? Many of you have been to um, presentations given by Dr. Adolfo Reutemann, who looks at Capitol Hill of Israel and tries to understand its significance of how Israel is building itself as a normal country with institutions that all have relations to the spiritual center. The universities, are they our spiritual centers? What are we doing within the universities? We've heard all kinds of ideas here. I was trying to think what the significance is of the fact that the podium has only some of the name of this institute. <laughs> Is this our spiritual center? Are museums our spiritual center? What can we do within the museums? I will give you two stories, and with that we will end. I'm trying to think with which one I shall start. Okay, I'll give you two, but bar, bar mitzvah story and a bat mitzvah story. Bar mitzvah story. Um, a man calls me up and says, uh, I want to meet you because uh, my son is going to be a bar mitzvah in a few weeks, uh, in a few months. And um, I want to come and uh, study with you. Okay, I said, let's meet. Uh, I would like to meet your son and uh, uh, your partner. And he says, fine. And they all come. And I don't know if you've been in that situation before. <laughs> I would assume you have. But uh, uh, you meet people, and they give you this long list of what they don't want. Okay? I don't want this, and I don't want this, and I don't want this, and a, a, a long, long list. And then I say, okay, so what do you want? No idea. <laughs> what is Judaism for you? What are your values? What do you believe in? And we start a process which you are very familiar with, all of the rabbis and, and the leaders that are sitting here, in uh, opening up this world of being able to articulate what is Judaism for you. And one of the ways to do that is to visit our spiritual centers, all of the above, everything you've seen here, for me is an option for being a spiritual center on different levels for different reasons, for different things. So one way to celebrate your bar mitzvah could be, I know, the wailing wall. Nope. It could be the Supreme Court. Not to talk about the Supreme Court, not only to talk about a hero, a Jewish hero, but to be there and to celebrate the institution. We are fortunate to be part of building these institutions. Why not celebrate there? Think about the impact, not only for the child, of being at the Supreme Court, celebrating his bar but mitzvah. I know you need a little bit of Israeli chutzpah to go there and to do it, but it's possible. Or if you want to read from the Bible, not necessarily Torah or the Torah, why not do it? Why not choose one of the magnificent uh, um, synagogues within the Israeli Museum who don't operate a synagogue, so make them operate a synagogue. In one five-minute walk, you can choose a German synagogue or an Ethiopian synagogue or a... Uh, a synagogue from Suriname, or you can choose. You can walk around and say, ah, that's mine. So this young man, after working with him for a while, took one of those. In Israel, it's called Madonna. Probably here you have a different name for these mics that you put like this on you and everybody can listen. Okay. Just imagine how the kid loved that. You do? You call it Madonna here too? Oh, okay. 
I thought she was famous for other things. Anyway, so, so this kid who was so empowered to lead this group through the Israeli museum to talk about our national Capitol Hill, to show the difference between Capitol Hill during the Second Temple times, and those who are going to meet me in Israel in a few months are going to do, do just that, and to see the Capitol Hill of Israel today, to be able to say, I own this. I am the authority to explain to you this geography. I can tell you what the meaning is. I can explain to you why it's such a normal country. To take you to his synagogue of choice and to read from, he chose from the Torah something he wanted to read. So he read it there. And it was so empowering. And the other story, which is also about the museum, I can give you other stories about other places, but we're talking about the museum now. A young girl with a mother and a father uh, arrived one day in um, some place. <laughs> I'll tell you about that place some other time. And she was extremely shy. Extremely shy. She, w she walked around, her eyes were like lowered all the, all the time. And in come a mother and a father. I spoke to the mother on the phone before. Not, I didn't speak to the father. The father comes in with a kippah on his head. And uh, we walk into the room. And there is tension. I can't even begin to describe the tension in the room. <clears throat> and I hear the story. Imagine the girl. Okay, She's sitting there like this. Her eyes are terrible. And the mother says that she was born Catholic. And the father says he was born Jewish. And the mother converted and hated the fact that she converted. This is them telling me the story, and the daughter is there. She hated the fact that she was converted because now they're divorced. So what did she convert for? OK. Let's see you getting out of this and doing a happy bar mitzvah, celebrate a bat mitzvah. <laughs> so I said, okay, our next meeting is not here. I'm going to take you to a journey through Jewish culture. And let's do this in the Israeli Museum. And why? Because the definition of the Israeli Museum is its practice. It has... Egyptian art, and it has South American art, and it has Israeli art, and it has Jewish art, and it has a normal country trying to say, this is who I am, this is my identity. I treasure treasures from all cultures. And we walk around through the museum, and we get to an area where there is on the wall many, many uh, Hanukiot, uh, Hanukkah lamps, various kinds, beautiful, beautiful. And we look at it, and for the first time, I see the girl smile. Not a word, but she smiles. And I start to talk to her about these candelabras and who she, does she think made them. Women, men, old, young, Moroccan, Iraqi, Ashkenazi, Jewish, not Jewish. For most of them, we absolutely don't know. She goes home, I get a call the next morning. The mother, in tears. She was so excited. She couldn't stop talking about these candelabras all the way home. And your ideas about Jewish heroines, which is not mine, Sherwin, was incredible. She wants to study about Jewish heroines. And I say to her, it seems that she's artistic. And she says, she is. And she studies ceramics. So I talked to her ceramics teacher. And she started studying about heroines. And she studies about Esther. And she studies about Bacheva. And she studies about uh, Henrietta Sold. And she studies about various heroines. Now, we have many. And then I ask her, by now I know her a little more, she feels more comfortable, she does these incredible statues. And then 
I said to her, and what about your mother? And what about your grandparents, your grandmothers? And she says, they're not Jewish. So I said, what does it matter? This is your candelabra. This is your life. This is expressing who you are. This is where courage and dignity come into becoming bat mitzvah. This is the only law there is. Feel free to express who you are. And she makes these statues of her mother and her two grandmothers. And then I ask her, and what about you? This is three months into the process. We're friendly now. She feels empowered. And she says, no, I can't be amongst them. They've done so many things in their lives. And I ask her, well, who's going to illuminate them? You should be the shamash. You should be the one who illuminates this candelabra. And that's what she does. Thank you. So we're going to begin. We have a comment um, that Rabbi Shalom would like to make. Well, I want to say that one of the most exciting parts about hearing Sivan speak is that I almost believe in telepathy where we find ourselves on the same page and responding to the same talks in almost the same way. Um, and what's exciting about it for me is not that I believe in telepathy, <laughs> but it's that, uh, it's that it confirms for me that uh, our movement really is on the same page in, in so many ways uh, between Israel and North America. I wanted to uh, make a couple of comments on some issues that you raised in your talk that I thought was, I mean, the talk was fascinating and spellbinding as always. Um, the first thought was, if we are going to try and market Jewish yoga, I think we need to be more efficient in identifying it as Jewish yoga, so I think we can simply call it oiga. <laughs> <laughs> Where you assume a position, and then you say oi, and then you assume another position and say oi, <laughs> and then uh, you proceed that way. Um, the two things I want to comment on was the question of uh, magic power and secularism. And the second is this idea of the spiritual center with which you concluded. Um, what we find is that the word secular is like a chameleon because it can mean different things in different places in different languages. Laïc in French is somewhat different from chiloni in, uh, in Hebrew and uh, secular in English also has different senses. There's often a split between secular philosophically and secular institutionally. So when you're secular philosophically, it means you're focused on this world, the natural world. When you're secular institutionally, it means you don't follow religious authority or an independent agent. And those are very different concepts. At one time, actually, in the Middle Ages, there were what were called secular priests. It doesn't mean that they were non-supernatural. It meant that they were focused on this world as opposed to the ones that were counting the angels on the heads of a pin. So... One of these challenges we have in people who define themselves as secular, we as a movement using the term secular to define ourselves, is, as we've found many, many times, what do the labels mean uh, with, with, those termino with that terminology? And historically, um, it's doubled for both. Uh, I mean, there was a, a Hebrew nationalism, a Zionism, there was a Yiddish nationalism uh, that was focused on Jews as an ethnic nation, but using Yiddish as the language, but many, many times they would call themselves secular, and it was an overlap of institutionally secular, we don't have rabbis and leaders, and philosophically secular, we don't believe in anything beyond this world. That commonality, that assumed identity between both means of secular is not necessarily the case anymore. Uh, and that's one of the transitions we have to realize. The second point I wanted to make um, is that this idea of the spiritual center is made real by the first half of your talk, that the authority is in the people. The people make the museums, and the people make the space holy. It's not the space that's holy. And I think Yaakov talked about this at a previous colloquium, where there was a major transition from the temple to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. 
Because it was, it was a transition from the Beit El, the house of God, to the Beit Am, even though you weren't supposed to call it a Beit Am. But it was the house of the people. It was a Beit Knesset, a house of meeting. The Beit Midrash, the house of study. It was not the house of God. And what made this space, you didn't need a building, after, actually, to have a full prayer service, to have a meaningful Jewish experience. You needed 10 men, of course, historically. Um, but what made the building special was the people in them, and not the building itself. So when the authority is in you, that changes everything. And it changes how you do the bar and bat mitzvahs. I mean, I just happened to get an email from the uh, Jewish Federation's Mekor Chaim rabbi newsletter that reminded me that today is the Torah portion of Tatsriya Mitzora, which is <laughs> leprosy and purity laws, and the priests are the ones who are deciding whether you're cured of leprosy or not. I mean, this is exactly what you started with in your talk. Um, and how far removed is that from today? But even more importantly, pity the bar mitzvah student <laughs> who is stuck with this date unless they are celebrating with us because they are not stuck with anything. In fact, we had a member of our congregation who had to change her kid's date at the last minute. It was a dicey thing, and there was this date in the middle of April that was wide open, and no one had booked it that were any of her kid's friends. And guess what? It was this weekend, and it was no problem for us at all because our approach to the bar mitzvah, the bar mitzvah, is the authorities in the person, in the child, in the family, to choose what's meaningful to them, be it Hanukkiyot, be it synagogue architecture, be it personal history of the family, be it a biography of someone important. And I think that that is one of the most creative and powerful things that we've done to create that kind of individual engagement and empowerment that we've been talking about. We're already doing a lot of that and have been doing it for decades. And that's all. <laughs> yeah. <Just reading. laughs> no, just, uh, so this is this is the challenge here. Wait, if uh, Sivan's not answering, I thought there was. A, um, I just wanted to note one thing, which is that actually my bar mitzvah portion was supposed to be Tazria Mitzora, <laughs> and actually my mother objected to it for exactly this reason. Uh, and um, keep in mind, she was the wife of the conservative rabbi. Uh, and actually had my bar mitzvah scheduled a, a week before I actually turned 13, uh, uh, you know, in order to make sure that I, I got a more normal portion. And so it actually happens not only in this movement, but more broadly. You know, your Jewish passport may be revoked. <laughs> All right, so we have some, vi being <laughs> some very interesting uh, questions from the, uh, from the uh, gathered people here. And also, um, I want to, again, welcome the, uh, the panel to chime in at any time. Uh, there, there's at least one person here who um, states that I couldn't marry my Druze husband in Israel, uh, but we did get a civil divorce along with a get and a Druze annulment, um, but it really relates to the overall question of uh, a different kind of intermarriage situation in Israel, and I know it's not as common, but it does take place, and that's between Arabs and, and Jews. Is Tamura in any way uh, involved in that, or do, do, do you discuss that? Um, about two years ago, I was teaching in uh, uh, college uh, in uh, Sapir College down south. You probably know about it because the rockets come there quite often. Anyway, so I was teaching there and I uh, was taking the bus uh, back to Jerusalem and this young lady uh, sat next to me and uh, you can imagine that we started discussing things. And um, I realized that uh, she's teaching law in uh, Sapir and as we continue the conversation, I realized that she's an Arab, she's a Christian, and uh, she asked me, what am I teaching? I'm telling her about what am I teaching. And uh, then I decide to try this out. And I tell her, you know, I'm a rabbi. And she looks like, what? Usually, usually you, you know, this kind of uh, uh, comment. And, um, and she says to me, do you do weddings? And I said, of course. And she says, OK, there has no legal standing. Yeah, we both understand that. She's an attorney. And, uh, <laughs> and I start to describe to her um, the whole notion of humanistic values um, and that weddings should describe and celebrate humanistic values. She says, wow, that's exactly what we need. Another story relates to this, and then I'll, I'll give a practical answer too. And the other story is, I think I told you this, that one of our, some of you, one of our, uh, one of the people that is going to be uh, ordained, uh, he 
when he came to us and we asked him, why do you want to be a rabbi? And he says, well, I live up north in the Galilee and there are many uh, Arabs there, Muslims and Christians. And we have this monthly meeting of leadership from the area. And there's a Qadi and there's a priest. And the Qadi says to me, what, why aren't you becoming a rabbi? That's why I came here for. <laughs> so there's lots of that going on uh, in Israel. And certainly in Tmura is to try and find a way uh, to create um, common spaces, common opportunities, common celebrations. Uh, we are certainly working on that. Uh, we are going to have um, uh, soon a, a, an event in which one of our rabbis is going to be reading. He's a poet, and uh, uh, he's going to be reading from one of his books. The name of the book is Sulcha. You can find it in the internet. It's written in Hebrew and in Arabic, and uh, it's an evening about uh, humanist uh, celebrating together. So certainly we're looking for ways to do that. And uh, as you can imagine, it's very complicated, but we're determined to try. Other comments from the panel? No? One other thought that I had from a previous session that I was curious for your response to. I didn't know if you were going to respond then, or if not, I was going to bring it up now. <laughs> um, and that is one of the Jewish community in this country's metrics of successful Jewish identity is identification with Israel, support for Israel, uh, endorsement of Israel, whatever you call it. And that is one case, as Paul pointed out in some of his statistics, where the children of intermarriage identify much less with Israel than, uh, than the sort of general Jewish population. And uh, I mean, they have positive feelings about being Jewish. There are other things that are positive, but the identification with Israel is lower. And my, my initial response to that was, given all of the difficulties that you highlighted about recognition in Israel, right of return, patrilineal descent, whatever else, that uh, I'm not surprised <laughs> that they don't identify as strongly with, uh, I mean, you know, why would I identify with a place that, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the opposite of the Groucho Marx joke. You know, he says, <laughs> I wouldn't belong to a club that would have me as a member, I only want the ones that won't accept me. But most people take the opposite approach, that if they won't accept me, then why, why invest time, energy, and emotional uh, commitment? And I think that that's a, I mean, this global campaign you're talking about would be fantastic because that's good for Israel to have, to show that it can be more accepting and welcoming so that more people would feel welcome to uh, become engaged with it. And the only might have some thoughts on this as well. Um, I, I, I totally agree with, uh, with what you're saying. I think it was Paul who talked about the values, uh, the American values and the establishment here. And sometimes, you know, our values and our governments are not exactly the same. And some, these things happen all over the world in Israel uh, as well. My answer to them is taglit. And uh, I hope more and more people actually experience Israel because uh, experiencing Israel is one way of uh, getting to understand a little bit about what's going on there, creating a connection with Israel, but also maybe even becoming a little bit responsible for what's going on there because it doesn't matter on which side of the ocean we live. We are responsible for things that are happening in uh, the world that we uh, practice our uh, Judaism in. And uh, we must um, work to change things. I am very much uh, for um, J Street. I'm also very much for APAC. And I hope there'll be other organizations out there doing various things, some pro, some against. At least stay active. One thing I was curious about in my <clears throat> pipe dream of a Big Ten Judaism is whether or not there is any reaching across the aisle, so to speak, from the authorities in Israel in recognition of the needs that you described. And uh, I also thought it was really interesting when you ta when you said, if I'm if I heard you correctly, that there's that the dichotomy is not between secular and spiritual, which I thought was really interesting. But I, I'd be curious to know if there's, if you see any opportunity or if that divide is just something that we have to accept. Okay. Uh, the first is uh, we created, after our first colloquium in, uh, in Israel in 2006, 
uh, we created the first uh, forum in uh, the Knesset, in, in Parliament, which is a pluralistic uh, forum. We tried to create a secular uh, forum, but then immediately the other uh, organizations said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about us? And we created a pluralistic forum, which may be a better uh, notion. And uh, even though the heads of that have changed, we're still very much part of it, and we bring in different issues. And uh, it's uh, and we do some, uh, not our organizations, but we make other organizations do the lobbying because we are an educational institution and we want it to remain that way. But uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job in, uh, in Israel. You say you put the heat under the feet and uh, for people to go and to be active. And uh, therefore, uh, very many interesting things are going on with various members of parliament, right and left. Uh, some of them acknowledge the connection with us, some are afraid to. Uh, but I would say that they are a lot more well-informed today than they were a decade ago. Both the reform and the conservative are also extremely active. We're active together. I just want to give a note here and then to answer your second question. Um, about a month ago, uh, I was able, after about three years of working on this, to create a conference of the liberal schools for uh, uh, rabbinical liberal schools in Jerusalem. And we created a conference with the Reform and the Conservative and us, a whole day conference, uh, talking about what rabbis uh, should be doing in Israel. And there I'm coming to uh, the next uh, question, which is, as you can understand, very important. I don't know if it was done outside of Israel ever, but it was certainly very significant for, for us. Um, and um, one of the issues that came up is the issue of uh, uh, spirituality. And um, I think that's a whole other conference, which is worth noting the importance of it here. We have to do that. But one of the things that we need to understand that um, creating a good ceremony or creating a good uh, musical piece or uh, creating any good work of art, if you don't have a spiritual moment within that experience, you haven't done it. So I don't think that it's by mistake that every religion always used art. I don't know if they could have reached what they wanted to without art. I'll leave it at that. I, I want to shift back a little bit to um, some of the issues of Jewish identity, and it plays into some of the questions that I've, that I've seen here. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a, a bit of a, you know, we, we tend to view things very black and white in, in these dichotomies, but there's a lot of crossing over that's going on. One of the things that interests me is that on one hand, we have this large population, 300,000 or more non-Jewish Jews, um, who are almost all from uh, the former Soviet Union. They have very much aligned themselves with Israel Beitenu, with Avigdor Lieberman. This is a right-wing party in many ways, particularly on issues of security. Um, he, on the other hand, while he you know, proclaims his, uh, his, his interest in, in equal marriage rights and all this kind of thing, he very much is sitting at the, in the same table with Eli Yishai and Shas and, and, and uh, all the Agodat Yisrael people and so forth. How are these issues going to be reconciled when the players come together on, on uh, issues that, that, are, that we may consider very extremist, and, and then are unable to, to really solve any of the problems of Jewish identity that are, that are really creeping forth so, so heavily there? Um, this is a very interesting uh, issue, but I would say it's a political survival issue for Lieberman. He certainly has a problem because ma many people in his constituency feel that he betrayed them and that this covenant of non-marriage uh, is something that uh, is shown that very, very few ever went to get this uh, certificate or ever signed up. So they certainly feel betrayed uh, by him, and I don't know if it will show in the polls, because there, as you know, people in Israel don't vote because of that. They vote because of other things. So... Um, 
certainly there's there is a feeling there that he didn't stand up to what he uh, what he promised them. Uh, we haven't been successful in Tmura, uh in uh, getting people from the former Soviet Union to come and study uh, with us to become rabbis. We're working diligently on that. That is a project for us. Uh, it's very, very complicated for many various reasons, uh, so I won't go into that right now, but it's I believe that once we have some inroads into that community, we will be able to make significant changes. Okay. Um, a, a lot of people here would like to know specific and concrete suggestions for how we can make a contribution to changing some of these, uh, these arcane issues in Israel. I'll think about it. Okay. <laughs> how, how much of this, and related to that question, how much of this is an issue of the setup of the Israeli political system in that parties can be fielded with a very small number of mandates, um, and as a result, you have splitting of votes that might otherwise be able to form stronger coalitions, right? That in, if you could raise the minimum number of mandates needed to field a party, that you would push people a little bit more towards central issues. That, uh, that does make sense, and one of the ways uh, to do it is, this was an initiative of the conservative movement in Israel, which uh, the idea was that you should uh, sign up uh, to become a member of a party, and the more people that would sign up would change the agenda of the party. And uh, this is the first time ever, uh, ever that we ever did anything like this, and we all got together around this issue, and all signing up to the different parties to try and change them, and we did that with the big parties in order to do exactly what uh, you, you are uh, describing. But don't forget, and here I'm coming to everybody's role here, but don't forget that one of the most important things um, for us to do is to change the concept of what is legitimately Jewish. And that is up to us people. Everybody in their own circle, we've got to be creative about how to do this. And we have to change the concept of what is legitimately Jewish. And the more effect we are able to do that within your communities, families, here, general public, that will also make a change uh, in Israel. I'm sure of that. And one of the things we have to come out with this conference is to think, what am I going to be doing next? And we're waiting to see your ideas. I will be sharing, you, sharing with you some of our ideas, but they have already written down. They're less interesting. I want to hear what you may have to suggest. So make sure that you think about it and you write to us how to do this international campaign of changing of what it is to be legitimately Jewish. Well, I think that um, you brought up some incredibly important issues for us this morning. Uh, I was pers personally very fascinated by this whole idea of the internal social rebellion that's taking place, Yoram Kanyuk being a significant example. I have a young woman that I'm, that I'm very close with, and it, I found out well into our friendship that her parents had never been married, and it was completely fine with her, and it was completely fine with everybody she knew, and it represented a whole trend that was going on in Israel, and they considered themselves absolutely married. I think they call it Yiduim Betzibor, known to the public in the common law. Um, so I, hopefully we will see more of this bubble up. If there's any other last comments from the, uh, the panel? And I do want to mention just two logistical things as we're adjusting the screen and everything else. One is about the past and one is about the future. The past is that we actually did a colloquium on the question of secular spirituality in the year 2001. Now it is some time ago, um, but we have a book volume published from that. We have the DVDs of that colloquium as well. If you're really fascinated by that question, it might be worth pursuing that particular direction. It may be time to do it again. Uh, but if we want to uplift the human spirit in our way, we have to find the way to do that. And for the future, I wanted to make sure that you have in your calendar, it's important to get things in advance. In December, tomorrow will be holding its biannual, biannual? every two-year conference. Um, <laughs> celebrating the ordination of the next uh, class of their rabbis. Uh, they've done wonderful conferences at the Israel Museum, at the Bible Lands Museum, in Tel Aviv, in Haifa. It really is a marvelous experience if you can go. It will be during Hanukkah. It's the Shabbat during Hanukkah. 
this December. Thursday is, I think, the 13th of December. Um, and so it will be usually a Thursday, Friday, and then onto the weekend, Saturday. So 13th, 14th, 15th. If you have family, if you have friends, if you've never been, if you want to go again, it would be a wonderful opportunity to connect with our fellow humanistic and secular Jews in Israel and also to experience all that Tamura has to offer. New dialogue. I would like to uh, start with a uh, statement, a thank you, and then a new idea of thinking up dialogue in a different way or reading texts in a different way. So, there are those who believe that God wrote the Torah. There are those who believe it was written by people. There are Jewish people who believe in God, and there are Jewish people who believe in man-made values. But you know what? Some may be the same people. Some may not. Each and every one of us is a believer. I wanted to dedicate this time and to remind you that dedication in Hebrew means lehakdish. I've mentioned it in the past to some of you, and it's important for me to mention it again because I think this is part of spirituality. Because the word lehakdish comes from the word kedusha, sanctity. And who's the authority? Who creates the sanctity? Us. By the mere fact that I want to dedicate thank you. Thank you to all of you here today, to everybody who organized this, to the fact that you dedicated time to come here. We all dedicated time to come here. And this dedication is a minute of Kedusha. So thank you. And now I want to go through an idea for a dialogue or reading texts in a different way. Visual literature. Language. Lips and language. This is what it says in Hebrew. Nechama Golan an ultra-Orthodox Israeli artist talking to us, dialoguing with text. An ongoing dialogue. Readers, writers, <coughs> interpreters. Does illegible text lose its meaning? Different works of art looking at text differently. Is it weakened speech? A high-heeled sandal made of paper, ink, and glue. The shoe is printed with a rabbinic text, which explains how a woman is acquired, or we would call it married. <laughs> the band-aids, the text you cannot touch, the text may harm you. How do you actually dialogue with text? Can it stop you from talking? Can't you talk about what is in the text? And when the text is Seder Nashim that tells you how women should behave and what should they be doing, cannot really let you talk anymore. What is important? The memory of the moment, the individual testament, the content, the form. Truth, she writes. She's hiding there behind the pole. That's Nechama Golan. That's Nechama Golan. New dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>